East and in many other traditions they've been saying that the whole existence is an interplay between matter and spirit. What do they mean by this? You see the word spiritual today, when you say the word spiritual, it's such a flimsy word because it can mean whatever you want it to mean. You know, all kinds of hallucinations have been created around this word spiritual. And what, you, what your idea of spiritual is may be different than my idea of spiritual. Somebody else, like many New Age people, communicating with angels and all that other stuff, they're calling that spiritual. This has nothing to do with spiritual, with so-called spirituality. When you say the spirit, spiritual comes from spirit. What is the spirit? When you come to know of a dimension which is beyond time and space, which is the very source of existence, then you can say you've come into contact with the spiritual. So, this word has been very much bastardized and uh, misunderstood. Now, you use the word spiritual, anything can become spiritual. And what is a spiritual experience? Experience is simply experience. You know, I've heard some people saying, think spiritual thoughts. How is that possible to think spiritual thoughts? Thought is simply thought, isn't it? The object of your thought doesn't matter whether you're thinking about God, whether you're thinking about enlightenment, whether you're thinking about nothingness, whether you're thinking about sex, whether you're thinking about a million dollars. The object of your thought is not important, but thought is basically thought, isn't it? So, and anything which is too different than what you're already familiar with can be interpreted as a mystical experience, can't it? So, for example, I've never tasted water. Suddenly I get the taste of water, and just because of the contrast, because it's so unfamiliar to my perception, it can be interpreted as a so-called mystical experience. So it has often happened that some people having just a few glimpses of something that they've not experienced before, they misinterpret it as a so-called spiritual experience. So what you call a spiritual experience, in that sense it's very relative. You have your own ideas, he has his own ideas, she has her own ideas. But essentially, when you talked about matter and spirit, you're talking about time and space, and that dimension which lies beyond time and space. Everything is being orchestrated by a much more fundamental level. What is that level? If it's the very fundamental essence of existence, isn't it also your own fundamental nature? How can they be different? They can't be different. Intellectually, the mind makes these distinctions. We're always living with the sense of separation because of the discriminations of the intellect, the distinctions of the intellect, the divisions of the intellect, always dividing between this and that. And then there's the identity, the sense of self and self-image that the mind has created. All of these things which give you a very strong impression that you're separate from the whole. But is that actually true? I would question that. Is that actually true? And this physical body, usually you think, okay, this is, these are the boundaries of my body, right? Usually that's what you think. But do you know in science, they've discovered that subatomic particles are always merging into other particles? So in other words, like let's say the wall behind you, there's actually a physical link between you and the wall behind you because particles are constantly melting and merging into one another and they've also found that no single particle in existence ever works independently. It's interconnected. Every particle is interconnected with all the other particles in a huge chain of cause and effect. So just think about it. Where does your body begin? And where does your body end? But no, you usually think, okay, this is my leg, this is my arm, this is my head, these are the boundaries of my body. You know? 
even in terms of the physical, even in terms of the physical, just that alone, there are so many misunderstandings just because of this experience of the mind that we are having. Unless you become a totally conscious being, this experience of the mind is, if you're living unconsciously, it's very unreliable. It doesn't give you a vision of things as they are. It gives you a vision of your interpretations of things as they are. So this is part of the reason why in yoga and in meditation much as much the way it's oriented much of the inner process has to do with bringing the activity of your mind to a stillness. Why bring the activity of the mind to a stillness? It's not because we're trying to escape from the mind. It's not because you're trying to repress the mind. It's just simply because when your mind has become so silent, then it becomes like a clear reflecting mirror. And that clear reflecting mirror is capable of reflecting things as they are. In a mind which is clouded, it's like running water. Now with running water, you look into the water, can you see your face in it?